Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in global GDP and 10 million jobs. So we are, you know, in, in support of our mission, we've been doing these roundtables for Years and years and years, and we are now at our 345th episode of these free sessions. Of course, we do numerous, hundreds of these sessions in our premium program as private sessions for which we do not broadcast the whole recording to the public, but this format of um, you know, roundtable format of mentoring, coaching, strategy, consulting, whatever you term it. And as if, you, if this is the first time you're experiencing it, you'll have, have a feel for it later in the program. This is a format that has been very effective for us, and we've been able to collaborate with people all around the world from Silicon Valley, but our team is also virtual, so it's been a complete virtual experience that has been a very effective one. Um, if you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. Join us on Twitter at 1M by 1M, and at, uh, you can also follow me uh, personally at, one, at Stromana. We publish a lot of very, very interesting content in, um, you know, through these Twitter accounts as well as all our other different social media platforms. So our YouTube channel is 1M1M Roundtables. That's where you'll find recordings of all prior sessions um, available. And those you would, um, I would strongly recommend if you're looking for free resources, learning resources, that is a great one because we always have interesting guests and very interesting discussions, strategizing on people's businesses. So it's a case study-based learning philosophy across the board. You're learning both from successful entrepreneurs as well as from peer uh, groups. So uh, do follow all of that and, uh, you know, engage with the program at whatever level you want to. I will tell, more you, tell you more about it in the, later in the show. Um, these are the call-in instructions. This is a roundtable, not a broadcast. So we want you all to participate as much as possible. I will put these numbers up later on in the program. We're not quite ready for call-in and, and uh, audience discussions yet, but we will be. So do line up your questions as you're going through the session with us, and, uh, and by all means, participate. We're going to start today with a conversation with Eric Frankel. CEO of MemSQL. Eric, welcome. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Sermon. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Eric, let's start by uh, having you introduce uh, your you know, company, MemSQL, to the, um, to the audience. Tell us what you do, and then we'll dive into your entrepreneurial journey a bit. Well, thanks. Sure. Uh, MemSQL is a real-time data warehouse uh, focused on analytics for the enterprise. Uh, you can consider us very much in the big data space. And uh, we started the company all the way back in 2011. So it's been six years and counting, and uh, we grow every year. It's a lot of fun. So you are a Stanford grad, and you worked at Facebook before joining mm -hmm. Y Combinator in early 2011. What did you apply to Y Combinator with? What was the idea? How did you come up with it? And also talk about your co-founder and his experience expertise in databases, because that is your sure. core technology background. Yeah. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a good place to start, I'd say, that I actually met my co-founder the very first day of Facebook out of serendipity. We just sat down next to each other at orientation, and we became great friends. Uh, later did I discover that Nikita was a phenomenal database engineer, and when we started thinking um, what it would be to do a company together and what we were seeing internally at Facebook at the time, this was back in 2010, uh, it really was seeing the future a few light years ahead of schedule. Uh, Facebook was coping with challenges uh, that many companies today are only now facing uh, with respect to big data. And it uh, became very clear to us what we could do with a new type of database technology by seeing how Facebook was uh, uh, contending and wrangling with their own big data challenges. 
so this was a, a, an idea that we applied to Y Combinator with. And by early 2011, we had to come to this decision to actually either stay at Facebook, uh, uh, go for the IPO as, as the rest of the company would, or we would leave and uh, join YC. And uh, we, we, I think we made the right decision. We decided to leave Facebook and start a company. It was literally two guys and a dog uh, going through Y Combinator uh, in the winter 2011 class. And your um... – in 2011, when everybody was talking about NoSQL databases and so on and so forth, you actually went for a relational database architecture. Talk a little bit about how you uh, managed to convince the Y Combinator people that that was the right direction to go. Did they understand what the implications were? Oh, of course. I mean, uh, you know, six years ago, uh, infrastructure uh, that was delivered to customers on-prem was considered to have uh, uh, become a, an open source uh, methodology, meaning that uh, most businesses that were now creating infrastructure software were doing so with an open source business model. And uh, on top of that, we were also in a uh, position where we wanted to deliver uh, relational database technology, but in a modern uh, implementation. And uh, both of these ideas were very contrarian, uh, both the open source uh, uh, business model being inefficient, which was a contrarian idea, and then the, the notion that NoSQL itself was more of a feature and not a, an actual uh, true uh, market uh, uh, for a larger industry was also pretty contrarian. People really thought that SQL had hit its uh, uh, end of the road, um, but what we have done with the company is really taken SQL, which is effectively just math, and scaled it onto many machines. So that's fully distributed joins. It's very, very complex transactional properties, all working in a distributed fashion. Um, so it's a lot of plumbing underneath the covers, but what we wanted to give our customers was an easy-to-use interface. And uh, one of the benefits of, of selecting SQL is that it's a universal language around the world and in every company. Business people can use it. Engineers can use it. Analysts as well. So when we wanted to build a uh, database and the fact that Nikita had a wonderful amount of expertise in building mm -hmm. uh, relational database technology, it was clear that if we were going to build a relational database, it had to be a distributed relational database. And uh, we did a lot more innovation with the core product, uh, MEM stands for memory. Uh, and therefore, what we created and pitched to Y Combinator was a distributed in-memory relational database. Uh, that would ultimately be used for real-time analytics at uh, large companies and other, other businesses. So you applied to Y Combinator with an idea that you watched in action in Facebook from use cases point of view and thought that other enterprises would need similar technology as data balloons and enterprises want to take real-time action on that data. In effect, you proposed a fast startup to Y Combinator. I suppose at the time one of Y Combinator's first enterprise deals. Y Combinator at right. the time was mostly doing B2C. How did Y Combinator process your application? Well, you know, we were one of the first enterprise startups to go through YC, and uh, it was very well received in terms of what the idea was. I, I think Y Combinator loves big, audacious ideas, and yeah. MemSQL is certainly that uh, for its industry. Uh, it, our industry is a $36 billion a year uh, uh, industry. And most of that revenue is held by you know, five top players, which are more acting as an oligopoly over the market. Very little innovation in the space. Uh, a lot of it is uh, the customers having to pay through the nose for technology that is no longer uh, innovative. So when we proposed this um, and later talked to other you know, VCs, um, it was pretty clear that the market opportunity was massive. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the uh, team had to be there to actually uh, create the vision and deliver the technology and the product. Um, so in the notion of uh, what is MemSQL as a, as a company, you just really can't uh, bootstrap a, a database company uh, from, you know, the, the spur one. Um, you need to actually fund it uh, to do so with a commercial license, like licensing model you would find in other areas that open source databases typically would actually be created by um, a core set of uh, committers. Uh, over time, you would find an open source developer community who are around that, that uh, piece of technology. And then uh, VCs would still have to apply venture capital to create a service wrapper uh, type of business around that open source code. Uh, with MemSQL, uh, we actually started, I think, very conservatively. 
Uh, and again, this is all relative in, in, in light of what it takes to build an enterprise uh, company startup in, in big data. But our initial fundraising was only about $2.1 million, uh, which was there to develop the initial uh, first build of the product and launch it to market uh, as fast as we could, which we did in uh, June of 2012. Um, so certain businesses, I would say, are only possible through uh, venture capital. A database yeah. uh, certainly is, is one of them. Well, and I think the Valley has a long history of doing core technology uh, fundings, but there are certain nuances to that. I think in, in your case, my read is that the fact that you had seen, one, you had Nikita and the domain knowledge that uh, yeah. Nikita brought to the party, and then two, you had, um, you had seen from the inside what was going on at Facebook in terms of technology use cases and so forth, and, and you, were, you were also bringing that additional domain knowledge into the place. So um, I, you know, my read with uh, watching so many fat startups, as we call them, um, being funded in, in the Valley, we have studied it quite closely. Domain knowledge is one of the core um, you know, requirements for getting any investor to touch actually fast uh, startup, even you clearly had that. Thank you, yeah. Uh, you have to have an expert uh, on a team to really uh, go after a particular uh, vertical or industry. Um, you know, for, uh, for Nikita, he had spent a number of years uh, in, in the space working at, at Microsoft, and then previous to that, his entire education from bachelor's, master's, and PhD was in database theory. Uh, right. it, so uh, uh, for that reason, it was very straightforward to apply to Y Combinator with this type of idea. Now, what about customer uh, use cases? You saw what Facebook was doing, but it was 2011. The, right. um, you know, the big data side of the market had not quite exploded yet on the enterprise side, but your, your hypothesis was that enterprises would start uh, you know, doing some of these use cases, highly real-time and, and uh, you know, data-intensive use cases. What did you learn? Did you talk to customers? What did you learn? And I'm still talking about that very early time frame, the Y, y Combinator or immediately after Y Combinator time frame. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the, the funny thing with the database is that uh, it takes a really long time to build one. And yeah. how, do you, how do you actually then take that, that reality, which is that it, it would take us at a minimum 18 months of solid work around the clock to ship the first version with the need to acquire a customer. And uh, the reality is that even though you are building a very complex piece of technology, you are still able to engage with certain opportunities along the way that are really to guide you in your product development uh, roadmap and, and deliverables. So I say that we, uh, we achieved our first uh, uh, customer, if you will, uh, inside of Y Combinator. Uh, this was about oh, four to five months. Maureen, somebody a, is uh, streaming. One second, Eric. Somebody is streaming noise into the call. Could you please mute the other line that is in? Okay. Go ahead, Eric. I think that's better. Sure. Um, so uh, was just mentioning that our first quote unquote customer was actually a fellow YC company in our batch that really needed our help uh, to scale uh, some of their, their growing pains. Um, so uh, that was our first real ability to kind of just work with a, uh, a, a company or a startup that was going through its own scaling challenges and we could understand uh, where we could help them. Uh, we did deliver an in-memory framework. It wasn't a database. It wouldn't be a database for many, many more months. Uh, but we were able to at least show and prove to them and help that the notion of main memory processing could be very helpful for any uh, type of web scale. Um, that's actually what got us uh, an investor. So uh, uh, Ashton Kutcher was an investor in that particular startup. Uh, when he had heard the good work that we had done to uh, save that investment, um, he gave us a call and I said, of course, come on in. Uh, we're wrapping up our, our uh, seed round uh, through IC. But along the way, when, once we actually left Y Combinator, we got our first actual paying customer uh, in about eight months of starting the firm. Again, because uh, you never want to develop in a vacuum. Even though we were building a very, very complex piece of technology, uh, you want to be uh, uh, testing your hypotheses 
uh, talking to the customer to, to see what needs they have that they would like filled with your software. So that uh, process was an incredible thing. That was actually Lady Gaga's social network at the time. This is the back plane all the way back in 2011. And again, it was a similar type of use case where they had a very complex big data challenge. And at that point, we had a team of engineers that could help solve it in a uh, database fashion. So we gave them uh, the very first version of MSQL, which was a version of the software just for them and just to that particular workload. And we did that because you need to build uh, against the real set of circumstances and conditions. And uh, it took us a few more months to actually graduate from that early process of, of uh, building custom towards building it a general purpose of the actual database software. That happened uh, by the uh, fall of 2012, where we actually acquired Zynga as our first enterprise class customer. That was our first real uh, enterprise customer that we saw uh, actual uh, repeatability in the use case, and we knew that there would be other customers like that. And again, that was really a two-year journey just to get to, uh, call it, two customers. And along the way, you wanted to validate with market research and other things to make sure you were building the right thing. And what kind of use cases were you hearing from that market research and talking to enterprise customers? What, at that time, in 2011-12, what were customers thinking, enterprise customers thinking they would build in, in your realm or with your yeah. technology? You know, back in 2011 uh, and 2012, it was very much a, uh, a focus on distributed uh, type of, of infrastructure. So um, this was a period where a lot of the bigger players were still running on appliance models. By the way, they still are. Uh, five years in uh, IT is not a, is, uh, a long period of time to get a, a, a fast switch in many cases. But um, in 2011, it was really a focus of how could you run a truly distributed uh, database mm -hmm. uh, that was fully relational. We made it very fast by elevating that data into main memory for fast processing and storage. Um, but uh, for us, we just saw this need that if you could uh, get businesses off the appliance model, which is a very uh, expensive, vertically uh, scaled uh, piece of hardware, to a horizontally scalable uh, architecture like Facebook, that would be the future. So it was really seeing, again, how easy it was for a company like Facebook to deploy 500 servers at a time with a click of a button. Uh, and we knew that would be the reality uh, many years later. Uh, of course, the cloud is here with us today. It's, Amazon is on a 10 plus billion run rate uh, with AWS. So now most businesses can use uh, very uh, cheap hardware on the cloud to run distributed workloads. And a database like MemSQL is able to run on the cloud very, very nicely because it's a naturally, inherently uh, distributed type of uh, uh, software package. So um, it really shifted from the uh, physical, the physics of it, which was vertical uh, scale versus horizontal scale, later then to the business type of use cases around real-time analytics, business intelligence in real time, uh, customer 360, financial analysis and risk exposure. All the use cases came a little later as we saw repeatability with certain sets of our customers. So mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of creating a startup like MemSQL, you have to have sound first principles uh, you have to make a, uh, uh, you have to make a statement about the future of the world, and you have to have a, a very strong and adamant belief that that uh, picture, that vision, will become a reality. And it was our uh, belief six years ago that the world would need a distributed uh, database to process the next generation of its applications. And uh, we're seeing that happen, of course, just uh, as uh, more businesses go to the cloud today. And you are a first-time entrepreneur. Who coached you through all this? How did you learn all this? This was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, help along the way from great mentors and advisors uh, as you work with your angels. Uh, and when we started the company, we were uh, uh, raising uh, from, an, from angels uh, in the Valley. Um, that They provided a lot of help. Um, but uh, functionally, you want to have, a, I think, a good founding team where you have someone like myself who is uh, uh, an engineer by background, but I uh, had really put my, my effort in, in a sales engineering capacity. And my co-founder was the, uh, the, the true technology uh, uh, innovator and engineer. So we have a very uh, yin-yang uh, uh, relationship because I do one thing for the business and Nikita does the other. So there was a very great way to actually work together to make this a reality. I very much focused on the fundamentals, uh, the market dynamics, the gaps in the market, the uh, uh, the research into 
companies that had tried what we've done and failed along the way, and then understanding why did they fail, and then resolving not to do what they have done. So you gradually find your way to a point in, in your uh, idea where you've exhausted all the, uh, uh, the potential uh, downside risks by identifying them and, not, and avoiding uh, a negative outcome by uh, addressing that, that negative risk to a point where you believe that the business model and the idea are really, really sound. And when we had that, that's when we graduated YC and were able to uh, finish up our funding period for uh, that initial seed round. Uh, but it took a lot of uh, engagement with industry experts, with uh, mentors, and certainly talking and seeing things firsthand at Facebook and in other companies to say, yes, we really want to commit the next uh, several years of our life uh, to shipping this product. And uh, what was the go-to-market strategy as you, you obviously you switched to enterprise as your primary market, not these small startups? Um, what was the go-to-market strategy that you followed to develop the traction that you eventually did in the enterprise market? So um, it's a great starting point. We had the option of uh, talking and, and working with uh, early-stage startups and companies versus focusing from day one on the enterprise. And we decided from day one that we were going to be an enterprise-focused company. The reason why is that you have to look at what you have as a core technology and who's it for. Um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, SQL is a very well-understood interface that most developers would find uh, uninteresting, so to speak. They would prefer to use um, in, the, in their own build-outs of applications, some more of, an open, of, a, of a NoSQL type variety, it's more novel. and the real value then for our software was not for the everyday developer. Everyday developer does not have web scale, uh, fast data challenges, or even big data challenges. Enterprises have big data challenges. And for that reason, we actually decided to keep the software commercial to ensure that we could actually create a sustainable business. Um, and we also wanted to uh, focus our, our, uh, our attentions on what the enterprises needed. Um, so from day one, the go-to-market strategy was to engage uh, strategically with certain uh, customers and prospects. Zynga was one of our first big prospects that became a customer because they really saw the value at their scale of something like MemSQL. Um, you know, I think one thing that's important to, to mention when, about go-to-market is that you have to go to market at some point. Um, uh, a database is never done, ever. Uh, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, IBM, they're all developing their databases 30 years into their own uh, product lines. And that just shows that it's an evergreen uh, type of field. It's always innovating. And I only mention that because uh, you have to launch the product at some point. And we decided to launch our product as an MVP, a minimally viable product, uh, in June of 2012. It was not our full vision of the software. It was only one machine that it would run on. So MemSQL 1B, as we called it uh, for beta, was a single box in memory database, which, which could literally only do a two-table join. Uh, so this mm -hmm. is the bare minimum to call itself relational. And we decided, well, you know what, we can't ship in at least until we actually provide one type of join to at least say we're relational because that's our vision. So we launched that uh, on Hacker News on June 16th of 2012. It had uh, more than 10,000 downloads in a single day. It was a phenomenal launch. And then we had to get back to work to build the actual distributed version, which shipped in April of 2013. So um, my advice to, to entrepreneurs is, is always get to market as fast as you can. There's a saying in the Valley, which is that if, uh, if you're not ashamed of your product when you launch it, you've launched too late. Uh, and I think if you always have a, a humility about what you're shipping, it means that you're doing something right, which is that you probably need to be shipping exactly then. If you are very happy with your product by the time you launch it, you probably could have launched a lot earlier. And you've raised 75 million, 75 million plus at this point. Could That's you right. talk about uh, the, the metrics with which we, you raised each round? Sure. So, you know, in, in the early days, the seed round is literally an experimentation round where investors are willing to invest a million to $2 million typically just to validate the, the thesis, the hypothesis really of, of the idea, of the startup. Uh, after you have proven that there is validity in the hypothesis, you have some evidence that the, uh, the startup is going to be uh, a real type of company, at that point you can then progress to Series A. Series A is really where you can start doing a lot more go-to-market. Um, you're still very early. Uh, typically you might have, uh, in our case, um, still very little revenue, uh, just a few hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue. But it gives you the ability then to go and take the team from 10 to about 25 to 30, 
uh, you can start hiring out a few more core functions that uh, one person was doing previously. So uh, for the first two years, it was myself and nine engineers. That was it. Everything, whether it was taking out the trash, running payroll, whatever it took, uh, it would fall on my shoulders because I wanted to uh, keep the engineers happy and make sure that they were working on the, on, uh, the software. Series A, you uh, have some revenue validation. Uh, you can bring in a little bit of uh, marketing, a little bit of g &A, a little bit of sales. And at that point, you're expected to actually uh, start graduating into uh, low million ARR, one million ARR certainly in, in the early days, but you want more uh, conversion of customers starting to click. You're still looking for repeatability. You're not there yet, uh, but you are now, by the end of your Series A, able to say, here are the set of customers that we have. Here's where we believe repeatability is. At which point you can go for a Series B, which uh, for us was actually a $35 million Series B, to really go to market uh, in a major way. And at that point, you now want to scale the business. Uh, typically, most SaaS companies need about $5 million ARR to consider a, a B round. So at that point, you really are going out to the, the, uh, the venture guys and saying, this thing is working. It has a massive market opportunity. We have X number of customers here, the use cases. We're generating this amount in revenue, so we've proven it out. We need more money to scale it. So at that point, you're now uh, at, a, at a process in your business where it's about uh, uh, growing um, your uh, initial core customer set even further. Uh, we did a Series C, uh, 36 million Series C a year ago. And uh, for us, that was a, a, a point in, this, in the process of Series C where you actually start using less of, uh, of a slide deck and more of, a, of, a, of an Excel spreadsheet. So in the early days of seed and A and a B, there's a lot of vision that's involved, a narrative that has to be told about what your business is going to achieve. And then by the time you hit a Series C, you are now sort of, uh, uh, saying uh, to the uh, prospective investors, here is the vision and here's how we delivered it. And here's the repeatability that we have such that we would like to raise additional capital to actually go even broader and uh, uh, bring in even more revenue. So uh, it's different for every type of industry, but certainly the notion that it's uh, uh, from seed, from uh, hypothesis to series C, D, and beyond, which is all about scale, uh, that's the gamut typically uh, you would see in, in these early stage type of uh, ventures. So the, the one thing that I would point out is that the series A has actually moved. Since you raised your series A, the series A has moved quite a lot. Nowadays, in, in, uh, in the Silicon Valley area, and, in, and, and you know what Silicon Valley does, is everybody follows, uh, the Series A investors are looking for a million dollar annual run rate in SaaS businesses. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so unless you have very serious pedigree, in your case, I think actually there is uh, there's that exception as well. You have, you, you're <laughs> coming in as a Facebook alum having seen a particular process in action that you're then taking out as to do a startup with with a very serious database expert on your team. Mm -hmm. that, particular, that team can go for a fast startup model, but most yep. teams, you know, we work with tons and tons and tons of entrepreneurs, so most teams don't have that kind of background. And, and for them, the requirement is going to be to raise Series A, you're going to need to get to 1 million ARR. And, and as a result, we are seeing a bit of a, a Series A gap. You know, you, you raise your pre-seed seed, and then you don't get to 1 million ARR, and as a result, it's hard for you to get to the Series A, but there is a, you need a bit more money to get to the next level, and, and there is a, there's a lot of companies that are struggling with that Series A gap scenario, but I, I heard about the, the Series A crunch as a result of uh, a lot of bulge in seed uh, uh, investing. So you're right. There's a lot of seed companies now that would love to graduate. There's a lot of seed companies. Seed. In and, 2013, uh, that's the latest number I have. Actually, I haven't looked at how many uh, since, but in 2013, 71,000 companies got angel investments. Wow, that's amazing. But the number of companies that get Series A varies between 1,200 to 1,500. It actually doesn't yeah. change very much. Yeah. So the, naturally, there's a Series A gap. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great thing to see so many new entrepreneurs uh, starting uh, out to, uh, to build a company. I think uh, that's what the world needs. It's really what America needs. Um, so the, it is a great thing to see uh, 70,000, you know, uh, uh, seed companies in America or the world that are there, but um, there will always have to be that filter. 
Um, it's just how that, yeah. uh, it tends to work. So, yeah, in, in terms of creating a, a, a provably successful seed level company that can graduate to the A, uh, revenue needs to be there. Um, we, even we had a little bit of revenue, uh, not a millionaire R uh, yeah. by that level for us, but um, if you're in a SaaS business, the, the greatest thing about that, uh, seed level venture backed companies is that it's never been easier to start one. Um, you don't have to worry about buying your own hardware, you, you use the cloud. You don't even have to worry about actually running your own core data services or infrastructure because you can actually lease those from Amazon or other vendors. So um, it actually lets the, uh, the entrepreneurs focus on the real part of the business that matters, which is typically the problem that uh, hasn't been solved yet. So uh, the reason why I, I, there's been so many more companies starting, it's never been easier to start a company, and I always recommend to uh, anyone who actually wants to challenge themselves and, and grow to do a startup but to do so in a way where they are very passionate and have done all the research to make themselves believe they can be successful. So you never should do a startup just to do one. But if you have a, this driving need to, to, uh, to do so, uh, I would always be encouraging anyone out there to uh, push themselves and, and, and take that leap. You only live once, and for me it was, it was very much um, leaving Facebook pre-IPO, leaving it all behind because uh, I would have regretted never taking that step. So I tend to believe yeah. that you regret not the things that you've done, but the things that you didn't do. And for me, That's if nice. I never left Facebook to try and push myself, uh, I always would have wondered what would have, what would have been. So uh, yeah. seed companies, I think uh, the more we have, the better. But it does create a lot of stress for those entrepreneurs that have to go and then graduate from C to A and beyond at every level. A to B is hard. B well, to C is hard. I think the, the, the issue that, you know, if you have, if you have that scale of companies – being birthed, we kind of need to understand the fact that, you know, venture-funded startups require that you have a, you have velocity. You have to go from zero to hundred million dollars in five to seven years and kind of show real velocity. And very few companies have those characteristics. So the, the fact that not that many companies get a Series A funding is actually reasonable because yeah. You can't have 70,000 companies that will grow at that pace. It's just not reasonable. Right. It's not viable. Right. So you have to define success for yourselves. And, and let's say you go from zero to five million in five years. And, and if, you know, some companies, some entrepreneurs will have to be, you know, reasonable that that is also success if you have a, you know, profitable business and you yeah. have a, you know, lean company and you're solving a particular problem. That's okay. That's absolutely 100 percent right. I mean, if you own your own business and you get to five million ARR, uh, you are uh, a success uh, in, in your own right. Yeah. I mean, that is incredible. As long as you're profitable. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of it. I mean, the, the venture capital is, is is an accelerator. It's it's its own uh, it, its own beast, really, because you take on money, you have to return money back to your investors. Yeah. And investors in IT like to invest in high growth uh, startups. So that means you have a high rate of, 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 of growth, nominally a, a phenomenally outsized rate of return. And for that reason, investors tend to take also a very careful look at who they want to back in this space because they owe it to their LPs, their limited partners, uh, to find those types of businesses. Um, so uh, there's nothing wrong with running your own startup uh, in a self-funded way that's going to get you to profitability uh, without venture capital. That's actually the healthy you know, way most businesses have been run. Venture capital is really – uh, a phenomenon of the last 50 years or so in the Valley. But prior to that, most businesses were, were self-funded by the entrepreneurs and, you know, they, they kept on going. Uh, Henry Ford started his company and uh, there was no VCs that were able to back him at that level. So uh, it's great to have a, an ability to pursue either path, but uh, either one takes its own uh, expertise and challenges along the way. Eric, what are the metrics of MEMS? SQL right now, and where to from here? Are you thinking about going public, or what's happening? Yeah, so um, our metrics are now in a uh, ARR, MRR uh, scenario, and it's, it's worth mentioning how an early-stage company will graduate into that arena, where in the early days, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. So you track what are called total contract value dollars, TCV. TCV would literally mean something on the order of a two- or three-year contract, but you recognize it uh, to the AE, the account executive, up front. At some point, as the business matures, as you want to get better resolution to uh, uh, annual recurring revenue, 
you switch to an ACV model, an annual contract value. So the TCD to ACV conversion happened for us about a year ago. Um, and at that point, uh, you are now looking about uh, 60 days away from ARR. ACV typically needs 60 days of, uh, of accounting to basically flip into uh, accounts receivable and then consider that to be annual mm -hmm. recurring revenue into the business. Um, you know, for us, we are uh, uh, focused at this juncture and in getting to a, uh, in a, in a, a sustainable independent company which is a roundabout way of saying that we are still at this point about high growth. Um, you know, over the last few years, we've 4X and 2X every year. Um, so profitability for a venture-backed company uh, must be on the horizon and it must be achievable, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a near-term goal if your uh, first order of business is rapid growth of at least 100% uh, year over year. And then by that juncture, because the nature of, of, a, of a business that, that we have at MemSQL, which is 90% gross margin, it just means that it's very uh, 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 lucrative to actually get to profitability once you're there. So you can delay that a bit um, as you uh, continue to build the infrastructure, the foundation of your, of your business. So at this point for us, you know, as we've now done our Series C, uh, we have plenty of cash uh, to fund us uh, along the way. And you always, at every level, want to have uh, a plan towards break even, which is to get to profitability and it's planned for accelerated growth. And for us, we have an opportunity to pursue either. We tend to look at uh, the fact that the market is very big and it makes sense for us to continue to take all our revenue and fill it back into the company for additional growth. Um, so yeah, an IPO is something that you always have to look about as a long-term goal. Uh, and you have to build a sustainable company. You have to bring your own oxygen up the mountain. You just can't think it's going to happen or you're going to get bought uh, as well. Uh, you know, the best companies in the world are bought, not sold. So the uh, real principles about building, about building any company, whether it's a Series C company or a Series C or D or uh, E or F, whatever have you, as it gets really, really returned to mezzanine, is you always want to be building a sustainable, independent company. Uh, and therefore, you can basically uh, direct the destiny of the company uh, to, uh, to the founders or management's uh, discretion and vision. Um, and that's where we're at, which is that we have uh, a product in the market that is uh, attracting new customers every quarter. Uh, we see a lot of acceleration. We've doubled our sales staff uh, uh, very recently to continue this action. Um, so in terms of, you know, where we're at, uh, there's a saying in the Valley, which is, I think, so true, which is that your first million dollars is impossible. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. Going from two to ten million is unlikely. Very unlikely, as you might say, it's just it's a hard part to get from you know zero to one, uh, uh, one to ten. But going from ten to a hundred is inevitable. And at that point, we believe we are obviously at this pro uh, point in our business where we just have to uh, uh, time how quickly it will take for us to get to a hundred million dollars in LTM revenue. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing your wisdom and learnings from. Uh the last six years and more probably. Um, we'll, uh, we'll be following your journey and uh, thank you for participating, Eric. Well, thank you, Sermana, for having me this morning. It was a pleasure to, uh, to join you guys today. Uh, I had a, a fun time uh, just uh, catching up with you, Sermana, so thank you once again for having me on your show. We'll talk again. Cheers. Bye-bye. Folks, we're going to switch now to the mentoring portion of the session. We actually, I believe, have four entrepreneurs. We have a full session. I want to set your expectations a little bit before diving in. Look, this is a working session. We are here because we are completely on your side. This is a safe place. You don't need to be nervous or concerned. We have no other agenda but to help you along in your journey. So uh, we want you to succeed. We are working, rooting for your success. However, you will get absolutely honest, direct feedback. There is no point in us having this conversation if we give you some sugar-coated nonsense which you can't do anything with. So our philosophy is to give you absolutely direct, sugar, unsugar-coated feedback, and you can do whatever you want with it. You can disagree with it. You can throw it in the trash can, whatever you want. But it is our job to give you right, the correct observations. Now, one thing, please keep in mind, not all businesses can raise money. You need velocity, as we just said, you need velocity in the characteristics of your business to be fundable. And if that velocity characteristic does not exist or is not evident in your business, investors are not going to invest. 
So um, not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. This is a fact of our industry. You have to acknowledge that. You have to work that into your strategy. And by the way, if you're not pitching today, please do participate in public chat, and I will open up the line for conversations later on. So do uh, be part of the round table and not just listen. Okay, we are going to start with Siddharth Bose. Siddharth, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Siddharth Bose, and our company is called The Shul. Uh, next slide, please. So we are basically based out of Pune, India. So the problem what we are trying to solve is uh, in India and even globally, in class 10th or in mid school, a student has to choose a particular stream, say math, science or commerce or biology. But uh, usually there are so many streams available, are all those being told to the student? The way it is being happening is we usually go to a career counselor who takes an aptitude test. And based on an aptitude test, a student is told that these are the 10 or 15 various options they can mm -hmm. pursue. But these are all theoretical data. What we have mm -hmm. done is we have listed more than 200 odd streams across all these math, science, and bio, and commerce. And we mm -hmm. have actually tied up with the working professionals of each of these streams so that mm -hmm. the data comes directly from the horse's mouth. So we have mm -hmm. basically, uh, next slide please. Yeah, so uh, we have bifurcated these services into various plans. This model is for Indian uh, students. In class 10th, mm -hmm. uh, what we do is we provide all the information wherein a chooses, student basically chooses, you know, uh, to go for math science or math commerce and all, so that uh, the information is known before choosing a particular subject. We have webinars from all these professionals. We have videos, we have textual content. Now, no content is being given by any career counselor. All of this comes from the respective working professionals. Now, in the next class, what happens is they have chosen a particular stream. We delve more or we dive more into those uh, particular selected streams. The length of the videos, the textual content, the webinars, they all increase in class 11. What we do in class 12, which is the last class, is uh, the selected stream. Now, informing about a stream is one thing, but stating which are the colleges, the admission process, the mock examinations, eligibility criteria, scholarship programs, all those are given in, the, in class 12. We don't interfere with the academic because already the boards are there to be, but a student is studying to finally you know, go into a particular stream. So mm -hmm. we help with that. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, apart from the schools, now schools has been our major focus, but apart from that, uh, we are also now working with some of the colleges. Now, uh, me being an engineer, I have faced this, many of uh, us faced this even today, that we all think that until fourth year or the final year of engineering or, you know, until we get a job, development, testing, or BI are the only major departmental areas which is there in IT. Same is the case with your other engineering streams like mechanical or electronics, but that mm -hmm. is not the case. IT alone has 35 different profiles apart from development. A bad mm -hmm. developer can be a good business analyst, but mm -hmm. it has to be told to They're the student at the right age. But yeah. it has to be told to the student at the right age so that student can actually prepare accordingly. So this is what we do with the engineering college. And we do the same thing for uh, mechanical, electronics, and the civil engineering fields also. Next slide, please. Yeah. So our future strategy for schools is basically for Pan-India expansion. Uh, we, we can roll out in the various regional languages and then partner with uh, uh, some of the DTH providers for on-demand services. We are already in talks with the government and the state governments to roll out the services in view of the government schools. So that's the plan for the schools. And of course, for the colleges, we, have, we also have some similar plans. 
Next slide, please. So our model, basically a business model, uh, as of now, we've been focusing more on the B2B uh, model. Apart from that, we also have the P2C. In B2B, we partner with various schools, wherein we uh, make the management understand why it is important. We get them on board, and then they make it a mandate for all the students to enroll to our services. But we are slowly rolling out P2C also, because we've been seeing some of the trends and some of the problems which we've been facing in B2B, so we are also now planning to go B2C. Apart from do that, you have, uh, now, um, do you have paying sorry? customer? Yeah, we have around 3,000 plus paying customers. And how much of that is come through B2B versus B2C? So 90% of it has come from B2B. And B2B with the Schools pay or the students are paying? No, it's uh, the students. The school does not pay, so it basically comes from the students. The school mandates the student pays? Yes, the school mandates. So we, we basically have to explain or you know have a workshop with the parents also so that we make them understand why it is important. And okay. so after that, yeah. Good. Okay. And uh, so what is the price point? Price points, it basically varies. Now, with the government school, we charge very minimal, as in approximately one and a half dollars for a whole month, and uh, so it and a couple of dollars for the uh, college students. That's for so per, per month. Is your audience mostly government schools or in private schools? No, no, no. It's mostly as of now. It is. Uh, private schools, but we are and also what is rolling the out. What is the revenue model for private schools, and what is the price point? Yeah, so we charge two and a half dollars per month. Okay. From each student. Yeah. So here is the. Okay, so let's. Uh, we are running out of time. Let's go to your questions. I understand the business. Let's go to your questions. Yeah. So if you just uh, move out the few slides, so we have a competitive analysis also. Uh, you have to tell me which slide to go to. Uh, oh, I think it is not there. It is the old one. Okay, so uh, so my question here is like uh, we've been seeing uh, some of the companies which are there in India, which are offering the various career counseling services, but they are, they have not got any working professionals on board. It is mostly you know, through the career counselors or only through the textual content. We have found one uh, one com company called Path Source. Now uh, it is a U.S. based company. Even they uh, have they have a similar kind of. They also provide various streams to students. But we saw that even they don't have the working professionals connect with the students. So how do you think uh, you know uh, scaling it up or uh, you know any suggestions from your side as you see we should be making changes. So anything from your scaling, side. Scaling. Global scaling perfect. people, uh, you know, random people who are uh, who you're counting on to to help you generate. Uh, can you uh, somebody is uh, ec uh, generating echoes? Uh, you need to please follow the instructions and not generate echo. Um, so the the thing that that becomes complicated, Siddharth, is that if you are depending from your revenue for your revenue generation, if you're depending on other people to do certain things, right? If you're assuming that working professionals are going to show up deterministically and regularly to do these kinds of career counseling without ever being paid, that assumption is not going to scale. No, so we actually pay. We actually pay each of the working professionals for each video. They, they charge us. Yeah. So is that a is that a recorded video or are you expecting a yeah. real time? So it's a recorded video, and recorded we keep video. updating videos. And the recorded every video month. Is, is very doable, especially if you're paying them. That's very doable. Yes. And if you have a repository. Um, of stuff that we that you you know that you're marketing building up that repository is not that complicated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that part is not going to be hard to scale. The part that is hard to scale is 
is selling school by school by school and then selling again to the students and the parents and all that. That takes time and it's a, it's a you know, high touch sales cycle. Right, right, right. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Alberto, Thank you're you up so. next. Thank you, Siddharth. Alberto, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Stramana and the, the staff and One Million by One William for this inspiring and useful work. It's really awesome. Um, so, I mean, I follow the, the guidelines, so that's me in, uh, with my little boy Marco in the picture and uh, some facts about me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a former actuary, so for those of you who don't know this word, it's um, actuary of uh, the technicians of the insurance companies uh, who develop mathematical models for uh, uh, risks and uh, making sense of uh, uh, the financial futures of insurance companies. Um, and um, I, I then switched to data science because uh, I'm much more interested in tech and machine learning. I really tried hard to innovate the insurance industry from within, uh, but it was really tough. Uh, on the other side, I'm a very, let's say, frustrated uh, uh, consumer of uh, insurance products. And therefore, you know, capping these two frustrations, I decided to uh, resign uh, last year and uh, to set up a business to uh, make something uh, useful for insurance customers. Uh, mm -hmm. I co-founded Speaksy with two friends and uh, the company designed and automates new digital customer experiences for insurance companies and uh, retail banks. Um, uh, next slide, please. So our customer is uh, the classic uh, large insurance company who doesn't have a clue of who the customers are. They're trying to innovate the distribution channels, trying to sell, to sell direct to consumers, uh, and, but they, they have very poor experience of doing that in an effective and um, interesting way. And um, on the other side, customers' experience with insurance companies is absolutely horrible at every touch point, whether it is buying an insurance uh, policy or uh, asking questions about uh, something once you bought or uh, filing a claim. So the, the first technology product that we develop is a white label uh, chatbot, uh, which is uh, used uh, uh, as a first use case for customer acquisition. Uh, so we plug the chatbot on different channels, whether it is uh, the insurance company website or uh, Facebook Messenger or other things, and the chatbot can help to uh, the, the customers to figure out what insurance he or she needs and buy it. Um, in terms of our story, so, um, we, the, the company is really young, but we had a lot of momentum. So last year we've been invited almost everywhere in uh, industry-specific conferences globally. And uh, we generated a lot of press coverage leads. So um, there is a clear, let's say, big demand from the market for this type of technology. And as a matter of fact, we receive the emails and we do receive them on a daily basis. We are now at uh, 228 businesses on our commercial pipeline. Um, However, you know, we, we, the team is, the founding team, we are all, uh, let's say, technicians and uh, um, we're not experts in marketing. We need to figure out how to go forward with uh, acquiring new customers. Um, next so tell slide, me a, uh, yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, these leads and customers, um, Alberto. So you said you went to 18 conferences, you got four leads on average. 228 businesses in 11 months, they have these converted into paying customers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, fair question. <laughs> so um, insurance companies last year were in uh, exploratory mode. So let's say that uh, um, they call us, they want to talk to us, but they, they haven't found out yet uh, uh, where is their appetite to adopt this type of technologies. So they do understand really well that it solves a lot of their problems, uh, but they're really, really slow uh, in making a decision and adopt a new technology. Uh, as a matter of fact, where we are now, we have like four paying clients, where one is uh, we are negotiating production right now, and the three mm -hmm. on the trial period, we are negotiating another 26 commercial contracts. And uh, the rest of the companies, they, they stared in the pipeline, and uh, it, it is an insurance that takes really long time to convert. So it's, uh, uh, I would say that insurance companies fall into the category of enterprises, uh, and they have a lot of uh, slower internal processes to adopt, especially new solutions. 
uh, the use cases that one of the, the observations yeah. just listening to you I'm thinking about is they, you're talking to insurance companies and these tend to be larger companies so so there is a relatively complex sales process are you familiar with this terminology um, economic buyer technical decision maker champion coach all this this stuff in the sales process you probably haven't heard these right so yeah, uh, that's right. So we haven't heard, but uh, we learned the hard way. <laughs> so we met all these uh, type of uh, people along the world journey. And uh, actually, in uh, in the last three months, we optimized a lot our sales cycle. So initially, from the first call to a sort of decision, whether the decision was yes or no, it took like from six to nine months. Uh, now we we have figured out who are the people that we know we need to talk to and what are the process to follow and we cut the sales okay. cycle to uh, six to ten weeks. Okay. And so that's more than good. That's, that, that's, are, are but basically, what you need to do is to create the create a tight sales. Uh, so we have you know we do a methodology. We use a methodology called Sales 2.0 in one million by one million and uh, and okay. and essentially what I'm. Basically, what I'm hearing is that you need to implement that methodology soup to nuts, and, and that is kind of the you know next step that you need to do. And it seems like you've already started doing some of that kind of optimization. Cool, that's great to hear. <laughs> and uh, what, yeah, what, so what other questions do you have? Yeah, let's say the next two slides are just a lot of good feedback we get from uh, current users of our uh, bot and, uh, and industry players. So these are my questions. So uh, on one hand is the, the crucial question whether raising or not external capital. Um, because, I mean, we are, we are really big fans of uh, revenue, uh, let's say revenue, revenue funded models. Um, mm -hmm. However, it's, um, we also have a question related to pricing. Uh, with the pricing that we are achieving right now with the implementations we are doing, we don't think we can grow massively this business with revenue uh, funding. Uh, we need to develop more technology products and more capabilities in our team to to sell uh, at higher prices and give more services and uh, grow in the business. See, the thing about funding is that investors would want to know how is this company going to be a really fast growth company? How are you going to go from zero to 100 million in five to seven years? And um, you can't say that we are going to get funding in and then figure that out. You have to tell a story, a narrative that investors can buy into. So you have right now, you're at about twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month in revenues. You need to, at the minimum, get this up to, you know, eighty thousand dollars a month, which is close to a million dollar ARR. And, and show velocity. So you, you said you've already cut down your sales cycle from six to nine months to six to eight weeks, which is a great step in that direction. But, but it's essentially, you know, we need to, as, as investors, we need to see growth and high velocity yeah. growth. And if you cannot make a compelling case for that, investors would not be excited about the business. So you have a chicken and egg there. And it's yeah, the exactly. standard chicken and egg that everybody has, by the way, not just you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's uh, it might be related a bit, uh, to the second question as well because uh, you know it's uh, it's a difficult call when you have a, to do with the corporations that take you know uh, six or months to make decisions. Uh, yeah, we we cut the sales cycle, but we we still meet companies really really slow. Yeah, so six to 12 months sales cycles, by the way, is not a problem if you have large enough deals. If you have little deals that take six to 12 months sales cycle, that's where you are most likely building a, you know, more, a, a slower trajectory uh, company, which is not a fit for venture capital. Yeah, it makes sense. So we can talk more uh, later. I need to move on to the next presenter. Okay, So um, hang on, I'll, I'll talk more about how to use the program to to get more help. Thank you, Alberto, for your presentation. Juan Molina is up next from Cordoba, Argentina. Juan, please unmute your line. Are you on the call, Juan?
No? What's going on? Well, we see you in the room, Juan, but we don't hear you. Okay, I'm going to advance the slides and see who's up next. Is, Sh is Shiva Kumar on the call? Hi, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Good morning. All right, Shiva, why don't you go? Can you hear me? Good morning, ma'am. Yes, good morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Thank ahead, Shiva. Thank you for Shiva. your time. Yeah, My thank pleasure. Thank you for your time for us. Yeah, yeah. I'm a former government employee. Now started uh, venturing into entrepreneurship. So this is my Go on, Shiva. Yes, yeah, yeah, please yeah. go on. Next we can hear you. Yeah, next slide, please. The project is called uh, Bingo Homes. It is a database. We are building a database for ready to occupy properties, ready to occupy homes, basically flats. That can be handed over in less than ninety days. Okay. So we have observed, uh, I work, I am, I am from Hyderabad, India. So in, in Hyderabad itself, there are more than 32, 40,000 properties still ready to occupy. So there is mm -hmm. there's no database for them. So each client okay. has to go to each builder, then talk to him, then see the flat, then decide. By the time he decides, that will, that will be over. So if he, we can, okay. if he can build a database in real time. So it will be easier for the customer to take the decision sitting from his home instead of visiting all these properties on weekends. Mm -hmm. So how we have so we have, we have started this uh, only at this is only one month old uh, enterprise. So in uh, January we have started AdSense and uh, Google Ads. We are receiving good leads, but uh, we are not yet built a database. So, so you don't build, have. What are you marketing then? Do you have enough properties Yo, in your database that people yeah, yeah. can come and look? Yeah, only, yeah, yeah, only few properties we have right now. So we are building we are building the database for, for Hyderabad in the first phase. So maybe in one or two months' time we'll have a good database. So in, in your business, it seems to me that having at least a critical mass of database, you know, populated yes. database is a requirement for people to be interested in um, you yeah. know, using your service, I wouldn't spend a lot of money in in advertising right now without yeah. without that database at least to some critical yeah. degree complete. Not yeah. complete, yeah, it has yeah, yeah. It has, but that has to be useful. Continue. Yeah, yeah, it should be it should be continuous. So maybe by April end we'll be ready to start start our campaign. So it's only one month old enterprise, and I have just found one co-founder is from ESU Bank. And he worked for a software company for 10 years. So mm -hmm. he has expertise in uh, blockchain technology. So Why do you need blockchain technology? What's, what, this is, a, so, this is not a blockchain problem. So we are, we are exploring if it, is, if it can be used in real estate or in any financial mm -hmm. transaction related to real estate. We are don't, try to, don't try to solve a problem that does not exist. Creating a database okay. of uh, creating a database of properties is not a blockchain problem. Yeah, yeah. So that is your first advice. So I don't go for uh, blockchain right now. Okay, thank you. So uh, my what, question what, is, mm, my question is, ahead. can I integrate services to scale up my business, or just I shall, shall I focus on sales only? You can definitely do services. Bootstrapping using services is a um, strategy that we recommend, that is a strategy that we believe in because you have to pay the bills. So if you can find allied services, yeah. associated services that would help yeah. generate cash and help you move along, absolutely do it. Okay, okay, okay. thanks, ma'am. Thanks, ma that's my other talk I have right now. All right. Uh, now, did Juan oh. Molina succeed in dialing in? Shiva, you can hang on. I'll, I'll spend more time on um, other things that you can ask more questions. I'll open up the line again. Okay. Okay. okay thanks. I'll be online.
All right, I don't see Juan Molina on the line. So um, I'm going to move on and give you the um, kind of logic of how to use 1 million by 1 million if you choose to use it. Um, and then we're going to go to Q&A, both using public chat as well as dialing in and asking questions. So by all means, uh, plan on engaging further. And, you know, before I do that, my request to you is if you like what we are doing here in One Million by One Million, please spread the word so that we have serious entrepreneurs coming here. And the word serious is in bold because we are interested in people who understand that entrepreneurship is a very tough road and it takes time and patience and resilience to build a consequential company. So all our resources are at 1mby1m.com. It's a completely virtual accelerator, and everything happens through online channels. And, and the best place for you to engage with us would be through the online portal. We have a great blog there that is completely free. Just following that blog, you'll learn a lot. We have continuous case studies and, and so forth. So you have a lot of people that you can learn from, and it's multimedia content. Um, we have the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, which is a case studies-based book series. There are uh, 12 to 16 uh, case studies per book, and each of them cover a specific topic. So we just talked about bootstrapping using services. There is a book on bootstrapping using services case studies, how entrepreneurs have used that model successfully, and you're welcome to, to read that to study more about that methodology. Now, uh, these roundtables happen every Thursday, and they're free. So this is our 345th session. Thousands and thousands of people have come to these, and over the years we have you know, engaged with a lot of people and addressed a lot of people's strategic issues. The full acceleration program is 1M1M one &one &one Premium, and that is a $1,000 annual membership fee for full extensive methodology guidance. We have a great curriculum that you can learn all these methodology elements, whether it's sales 2.0 or market sizing or customer acquisition, all these different elements. You can learn through the curriculum at your own pace, at your own time, because it's an online video lectures and case study based curriculum. We help you with business development as long as you're interested in reaching anybody in our network, we will connect you. Our entire Rolodex, which is extensive, is available to you. Um, Strategy consulting through these kinds of roundtables, but they're private roundtables. And then we help you with both assessing fundability, getting to fundability if your business has those correct characteristics, and then getting introduced into the funding community, into investors, negotiating deals, funding deals, all of that is part of the offering. And then we have a lot of cloud in the media so we can help you get the word out about what you do, your particular offering. So that's another piece of the offering. The one on one self-assessment is a series of questions which we recommend that you go and ask yourself. These are questions that investors would ask you. But even if you don't raise money, these are questions you should be asking yourself because you are the most important investor in your business. Now, as you're doing that, if you run into methodology gaps, you know, there are all sorts of questions, terminology, et cetera, you encounter them. Maybe you don't know how to address that piece of the equation, that part of, you know, how do you do this? You can always go to 1M1M one &one Basic, which is our curriculum only offering, $99 a month, and just spend intense amount of time on the curriculum and plug your methodology gaps. That's another very reasonable way for you to learn how to you know, what you need to learn. Early stage entrepreneurship, first time entrepreneurship is an enormous learning curve. And what we are doing here is to give you mechanics with which to accelerate that, how you travel through that learning curve. Um, so go to the website, there's tons of information about what to expect from the various program pieces, and there are lots of video FAQs, and you can just figure out for yourself whether this program is for you or not. And if you decide you need help with figuring that out, you can ask questions, we will answer, and you can move right along. 
This is a case study based program. As much as possible, we have tried to connect you with case studies that would be relevant and will help you learn from other people who have traversed the kinds of challenges that you are, tra you are trying to get past. So it's very much, uh, we've, we've had over 750 successful entrepreneurs participate with their case studies, their journeys, their advice, their lessons from the trenches, and you get to learn from all of them. And our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. Even if you raise money, you're gonna to need to bootstrap first and then raise money later. And that is just the way the industry operates. So round tables are available every week until the end of April, actually until the end of May most likely. So come talk to us, you know, get your issues sorted out and uh, you know, we'll do our best to remove whatever blocks that you are encountering. Um, these are the call-in numbers. If you have questions, you're welcome to call in. You can also start asking questions in public chat. And meanwhile, uh, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you have questions about the program, if you'd like to talk to somebody before joining the program, feel free to call Irina Patterson or email her first, irina at 1mby1m.com. That's it. For today, I'm very much interested in listening to your questions and talking about various issues that you might be interested in discussing today here. Um, Rajan Tripathi, I think you were commenting on Siddharth's company and your question was, why are you targeting only students here in the USA? Anyone can change a career at any stage of their life. Do you think opening it up to all spectrum could make it more useful for you and others as well. A bank executive could be an implementer of SAP financial module. What is your take on this? And Siddharth is answering your question. Hi Rajan, targeting a larger audience will make the company more of a consulting firm. We want it to be more student oriented. So I would like to answer that question both for both Ranjan and um, Siddharth. It is very important to choose a you know, precise market so that you can tune your offering to that market. Going very broad and trying to address all kinds of different segments with one company is very difficult to make work. Part of our methodology is really, really, um, you know, it, you need to be very precise with your positioning and that's one of the elements of our methodology is precise laser sharp positioning. So I think Siddharth is actually doing the right thing. Ranjan, your instinct in this case is wrong. So if you're more interested, if you're interested in learning more about it, go do the positioning module um, in the you know, curriculum. You can do it with either 1M1M Basic or with 1M1M Premium. Either way, you will have access to the, the curriculum and that's one way to learn positioning. And, and by the way, I see a question from Alberto. Thank you, Sraman. I didn't quite get where I can get guidance on enterprise sales on the website. Alberto, I think the fastest way you can do that is by signing up for 1M1M one one Basic and then going and doing the Sales 2.0 module under Customer Acquisition. So you will see there's a module called Customer Acquisition and under that there are all sorts of sub-modules. Do the Sales 2.0 module as the starting point and it precisely guides you through the Whole Sales 2.0 methodology blueprint. Does that answer your question, Alberto? Great. Um, Shiva Kumar, you're asking real estate business involves legal implications, how to overcome them. Um, Shiva, the way you are doing it, you're, you're basically creating a database of properties. So you're going to need to figure out how you're going to create that database by working with the people who own these units, but I don't think there is any legal implication. As, as long as you are not completing transactions on your website, if you're trying to complete transactions on your website, that's a whole different game. If you're right. playing a pure search engine business, I don't think there are legal implications necessarily. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Thank you. Right? Any other questions, folks? Anybody? Hmm. 
no uh, no other question ma'am yeah yeah yes? this is shiv kumar yeah Go how ahead, I, how i can reach mag- maximum number of builders in a shorter time so i have to reach so many builders yeah so, so go for the larger properties to... the best yeah. way to do it would be to go for the larger properties and the owners of the larger properties so that you know in one shot you have a large number of properties yeah. that fit the criteria that you're putting forth yeah yeah right now i'm going to associations like credai credai association is there in india it is a real estate builders association yeah but credai is not going to give you the credai will not be able to give you the data that you need to make this yeah, yeah, business yeah, work yeah. you're going to need to right. work with builders directly builders. and yeah, and yeah. you need to so what i'm saying is prioritize those builders who have large numbers of units under under their umbrella yeah, yeah okay okay thanks thanks yeah anybody else All right folks we will adjourn then and uh, we will see you back here next week and uh, hopefully uh, hear from more of you and work with more of you and your businesses see you soon and good luck making lots of progress meanwhile bye everybody yeah, thanks thanks for coming